Hello, Omar. My name's Ben. Do you mind if I examine you? No. Can I ask you to stand up to begin with, please? Please, could you take some steps towards me, turn around and walk back? Observe the patient's gait, looking for symmetry and smoothness. Now could you just lift up your shorts for me? From the front, look to see if the stance, shoulders and pelvis are straight. And is there deformity the of the hip, knee, ankle or foot? Or is there any muscle wasting? Assess the straightness of the spine and the bulk of the gluteal muscles. Note any scars, sinuses, dressings or skin changes over the joint. Now could you get back onto the couch? It is always good practice to make sure that the patient and you are as comfortable as possible during any examination. Adjust the height of the couch if necessary. I'm going to lie you flat. The hip joint itself is not directly palpable. Rest your head back. Just going to feel over your hips. Let me know if it's sore. Palpation of the greater trochanter may be tender in trochanteric bursitis. Although not shown here, the lesser trochanter and ischial tuberosity can also be palpated. Movements of the hip are tested passively. Care must be taken to isolate the joint being tested. When testing hip flexion, the left hand is placed against the sacrum to detect any flexion occurring at the lumbar spine. And the same with the other side? Lumbar spine flexion could contribute to apparent hip flexion, masking a limitation. The normal range of flexion is from the neutral position here to 120 degrees. Now I'm just going to bring your leg out to the side. Let me know if it's sore. Again, the left hand is important to isolate movements at the hip when testing abduction and adduction. The pelvis is stabilized by the left hand on the opposite iliac crest. And we'll repeat the test on the other side. Abduct the extended leg until you feel the pelvis start to tilt. The normal range is 45 degrees. Adduction is tested by moving the extended lower limb medially over the other one. The normal range is 25 degrees. Just relax your leg. Rotation of the hip is first tested with the leg in extension. Roll the leg on the couch using the foot to indicate the range of rotation. And relax. The normal range is 45 degrees in each direction. Painful or restricted rotation movements are a common feature of osteoarthritis of the hip. Just going to bring the leg up again. Rotation is also tested with the hip in 90 degrees of flexion. Again, let me know if it's sore. In this position, the leg indicates the range of rotation, but can sometimes be confusing. This maneuver shows internal rotation. And the same with this leg. Flex it up. Watch the patient's face for signs of discomfort, external rotation, and internal rotation. In flexion, the normal range is also 45 degrees in each direction. Could you roll over onto your front? To test hip extension, we need some room posteriorly. For the patient's comfort, make sure that the couch is flat. Again, the left hand palpates the sacrum to detect movements out with the hip. Just going to lift your leg up again. Gently lift each leg in turn to assess the range of extension. And the same with this leg. The normal range is from neutral to 20 degrees of extension. Now roll back over. Next we show the special tests. Starting with the Thomas test for fixed flexion deformity. Limited extension, in other words. And again, can I put my arm under your legs? Flex both hips up as far as possible and feel that the lumbar lordosis is eliminated. From this position, we're testing the left hip. Now straighten your left leg and put it flat down onto the couch. Keep the non-test hip and the lumbar spine flexed while the patient extends the other limb. And we'll do the same on the other side. Let me pop my hand under your back and bring your legs up. If the patient cannot get the test leg flat onto the bed, this indicates a flexion deformity. And bring your right leg down, flat onto the couch. Remember that extremes of hip movement may risk dislocation of a total hip replacement. The next special test is to examine for limb shortening. If you just lift your vest up for me and pull your shorts down a touch. The patient should have the legs stretched out as far as possible and in equivalent positions. 
to eliminate any soft tissue contracture or abnormal posture. Let's just straighten you. That's it. Measure with the tape from the umbilicus to the medial malleolus. This is the apparent length and will include any deformity of the lumbar spine or angulation of the pelvis. Readings from both sides should be recorded and compared. Measure the true leg length from the anterior superior iliac spine to the medial malleolus. There are many causes of true shortening of the limb and an exhaustive list in the textbook. If you detect any discrepancy in limb length, this should be followed up with block testing. Although not performed here, this is described in the textbook. The final test that we demonstrate here is the Trendelenburg test for normal hip abductor function in weight bearing. Can you just stand up for me, Omar? Normally, when standing on one leg, the opposite iliac crest should rise because of abduction of the weight bearing hip by the gluteal muscles. Now, I'm going to ask you to stand on one leg. If you feel like you're going to lose your balance, use my arms as support, okay? Stand on your right leg. Carefully watch or palpate the iliac crests to see if they move up or down. It may be necessary to hold the posture for 30 seconds to demonstrate early fatiguing in the gluteal muscles. And there are many other causes of a positive Trendelenburg test.